Hello, everyone. Welcome. We just uh, welcome to the space. Nice to see you all. In these times of COVID, when many generations of old and long standing systemic oppression and suffering based on race, on gender, on sexual orientation, on class, and other dimensions have become even more pronounced, we're also witnessing and participating in the enhancement of community, of resistance of radical love and of hope. And so we're here to really learn together through this suffering and the hope, which is evident all around the world. And we're really uh, fortunate to be bringing together uh, guests, friends, speakers from, from around the world. We'll have Michael, Charlene, Latoya, and Jayusu, voices from, from these struggles of, of suffering and, and hope. So I, when I first got on, um, and it was just the three of us, one of the things I said was that I'm nervous out of my mind. And um, I'm a believer that nerves are good, right? Because nerves, number one, means that you care, but also that keeps you human. This point around caring, particularly in this moment, is so, so important because I think that it calls for that as part of the conversation today would be about radical love or radical tendency. We're going to do a couple of things. We're going to have a great, great dialogue. Um, I mentioned Ultra Red because I am going to use a couple of sound objects. Ultra Red uses sound objects, audio and video to, in, to, to be able to engage in dialogue or, or investigations of systems of oppression. Ultra Red, we call them listening sort of protocols and listening tools. And we'll engage in this dialogue of listening to the struggles of Black folk in the diaspora of the globe. Um, but before I do that, I wanna, I wanna read something. I was thinking about not only is this the 50th anniversary of Pride, but we are in the US going into next weekend, sort of the, the dialectical tension sort of celebrate a holiday, the 4th of July, which marks the Independence Day, so-called, right? So a critique has historically had to be made, and I saw I wanted to read very briefly something that Frederick Douglass wrote in 1952 in Rochester, New York, and asking the question, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? And we can sort of nuance American slave to sort of talk about global marginalized people. But he said, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgiving with all your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of the United States at this very hour. What, what a moment that we're in. But words, you can hear the echo of an ancestral cry in this moment, asking sort of this question in this moment, what does it mean to be human? The troubles of this world 
I know soon I will be done with the trouble of this world. I'm going home to live with God. Soon I will be done with the trouble of Troubles of the world, the trouble of this world. I know soon I will be done with the trouble of this world. I'm going home to live with God. With the trouble of this world, oh, the trouble of this world, oh, the trouble of this world, not so much pain, soon I will be done with the trouble of this world. I'm going home. So as we begin this conversation, um, I'm reminded, I was having dialogue with a couple of friends of mine about particularly this moment, this intersection of a global pandemic of infectious disease, as well as this global pandemic of racial unjust, that I'm a believer that the universe is asking us to take a cosmological pause. And in this pause, I think that the universe is throwing out three propositions. And the very first one is a philosophical one, which asks the questions, who do we desire to be now? Dr. Cornel West sort of centers this through what he calls Socratic energy, the notion of internal reflection. Who do we desire to be? The second one is a theological proposition that asks, how do we desire to love? and love more expansively. I am a, a, a graduate of Union Theological Seminary and a student of womanist theology that comes out of the ethos of black women. And one of its tenets is this notion of redemptive self-love. So that the critique of redemptive self, redemptive suffering, which in many ways have had impact devastatingly over black bodies. And the third one is a political one. How do we organize politically differently? Move away from the notion of the right not to die, but around the right to live. I'm gonna say that again. Moving away from the notion around the right not to die, but towards the right to live. So I'm gonna open it up and ask my great colleague, Dr. Charlene Sinclair, 
to, if you will, to respond to some of those things, but particularly, you know, I, I know you well. And so you, 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 in many ways, you represent this dialectical tension being born in Guyana, South America, and, and being raised in what we call the hood theology of Newark, New Jersey, right? And how you have been able to navigate sort of the voices of those who have been sort of pushed out of the black struggle for freedom through American imperialism. So Dr. St. Clair. Thank you, Michael. Thank you all for this amazing space. Um, I am so happy to be here with you. So happy to be in dialogue. I'm excited to hear um, what emerges from our conversation together. So it's with deep gratitude that I join you all this morning. And um, as Michael said, I am also extraordinarily nervous. I'm a, a movement organizer. And so it is rare that I am in spaces uh, like this one. I'm usually, you know, somewhere in some community with my sleeves rolled up trying to figure out how to move through protests and keep people safe and, and how to deal with organizers that are completely um, uh, dissembling in some of these moments. So it is also with gratitude that I have this space to, to be in a room with folks that can be thought partners and help me think through some of the things that have been going through my head over the course of the last, um, really over the course of, of my, my time doing this work that has been really sharpened um, over the last three months or so. So let me um, begin with Michael's introduction. I am indeed Guyanese, um, born in, in Guyana in South America in the village. I am not a city girl. I'm a, a village, rural village girl. And I say that because I actually grew up in Newark, New Jersey, which is, as Michael said, the hood. But for people that know um, Guyana and, and Guyanese women, Guyanese women are hood women anyway. We just, we just do what we must do. We take what we must take. We move the world the way we must. And so it's a transporting from a, a rural hood community to an urban hood community. But I take that that through line with me. So some of my comments will be, will be met with some of that. Um, and I appreciate, Michael, that you opened up by talking about the right to live because what is uh, really in me right now, and I did, I did a couple of, of questions, sort of statements and questions. So rather than a normal sort of presentation, I want to offer the things that are troubling my head and my heart for us to be in dialogue together with. And so um, I'm assuming that's okay. Even if it's not, you should nod and tell me it is okay. And so, um, so let me start by uh, this piece around the right to live. What I've been really struggling with and have gone back to is the work of um, Ashil Mbembe, Necropolitics the framework of necropolitics in thinking about this movement, I think is extremely critical. Because um, here in the States, I come out of community organizing, which is a movement that is centered around somehow this, this um, combating of, of, uh, of power, of corporate power, of um, capitalist power with the power of people. And I've, as I've gotten older and gotten clearer about what is happening, I realize that we have always been functioning in this framework um, of, of a battle for the right to live and, um, and without understanding the power, the sovereign power of the state um, to kill us. And I think that part of the reason why we have not understood that sovereign power is because the right to live that many people of color, many black people have been fighting for has been the right to, the right to live the white life. And so there is a sense that if you live a white life, you will then be able to actually live. And so there is a process of doing this work, which is often an appeal more to whiteness than a, than a grounding in our reality as, as Black people. And I say that provocatively, 
um, and hope that others will engage me in this conversation around that in particular. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the COVID moment and the George Floyd moment and how they have converged into this challenge around this question of life. And one of the, a couple of things that, that, that I am observing in this COVID moment, one of which stems back from my early days in organizing. I came to organizing um, as a welfare mom primarily. And so, uh, so I tracked what was happening with the social safety net in this country. One of the ways in which uh, this country has been able to, to really continue to move violence and oppression is to ensure that there is not enough of a safety net to enable participation, to enable full democratic participation. One of the things that Du Bois said was that like, how can you actually have democracy if people can't eat? And so by keeping folks at this edge of precarity, then you ensure that you don't have full on participation. And I say this because we've seen in the US, you know, a, a squeezing, squeezing, squeezing of the social welfare state to the point of almost non-existence. And, but what this COVID moment has done, interestingly enough, is actually expand that to the point where people now have room to participate. So some of what is happening in the streets is of course outrage, but what we also have to take into account is that for, um, for a long time, people have not been able to actually engage outside of the market. But suddenly here's the room and the space to protest and protest for days. And so we have people living a different kind of an environment. So you have, instead of um, people figuring out how to manage two and three and four jobs, you know, you still have poor people, more impoverished people having to do essential work. But then you have this other like strata of folks that all of a sudden now have free time that is not tied to um, their wage work. And interestingly enough, is also not tied to the, the normal materiality of the things that they think they're striving for. They can't go to dinner. They can't go to the movies. You know, they can't go to the bars or out dancing or what have you. And so the, the like you said, Michael, this, this pause is actually not only a pause of reflection, but it, it gave space and time for people to, you know, to exercise that. And interestingly enough, which is another piece that I'm, I'm really struggling through, is that um, what happens now that the things, the desires that have been created around all of these other material things have now shifted because you can't have access to it. And not only can you not have access to it, some of these things can actually create death. So it, it's a now we're in this, this world where we have to have a different relationship with things. Because in the early part of COVID, every, everything that you heard was, well, you can't touch this, you can't buy this, you can't bring this in, into your home, et cetera. All of a sudden, this world of things that we were constantly grabbing towards now became deeply, you know, we became deeply suspicious of all of these things. And, and then, you know, so what does it mean to now be in a place where that got decentered a bit for folks and how do we translate that? And, you know, what about this question of desire? Because what I'm seeing now is that the desire that used to be a desire, you know, the individual desire to own, you know, is there's this eking desire now to be on the quote, the right side of history. So all of a sudden, there is like a moral frame that is increasing and is in this, this combat between material things. So how will you be judged? Are you judged by your large home and your fancy car and the things that you have? Or are you judged by, by history around how you are in this moment has also become 
sort of the, the moniker of conversation, which I think has been deeply interesting. The other piece around that is this question around um, suspicion. You know, when we first started thinking about uh, COVID and, you know, it, the question of the other and the very suspicious other now becomes problematized because the other used to be the black other, the dark other, the other that, that is somehow outside of heteronormativity. Now you have to be afraid of your grandchildren. You have to be afraid of your spouse. You might have to be afraid of your neighbor. So now we're in this place where it's, it's not so easy to begin to, to think about what will harm you. So we, you know, COVID actually created all of this, this interesting space for folks to, to think about. And then we enter into this interesting space with you know, the death of um, George Floyd and, and then what has happened to that. And so now we have all of this and then we see in a very um, visceral way, the state taking the life of this black man. And we see this in such a way that um, there are a couple of points here that I wanted to raise, like this, this contradiction all of a sudden between um, the state that, that many white people had thought of still as, you know, as part of the law and order, this is what, you know, keeps us safe. This is how society needs to be. And then all of a sudden, we're in this place where all of that becomes questionable, where you see and you cannot unsee the complete power of the state. What normally has happened is that even when you have killings of Black people, Black women and Black men, there is this rapid rise up of creation of criminality of the person that was killed. And so that always allowed for the state to then potentially, you know, not be this, um, this sovereign who ha had the right to determine who gets to live and who gets to die. Because the question around what did they do always remained. But now with, the, with George Floyd, you saw it fully in front of you, the state acting out its ability to determine who gets to live and who gets to die. And so the, the realness of that, the clarity around that, you know, put into um, real tension how folks have begun to think about the world around them. And um, the piece around that too, that I think is really important is that, you know, many black people will say, well, we knew this all along. This is not anything new for us. What is happening is that you're seeing, you know, young white people engage in this question in ways that they had not before. And not only are they engaging in this question, but they are being met with the same level of brutality. They are being met with the same level of terror as Black people have been met with. And so now there's a, a, a disillusionment around the protective sort of veil of whiteness. And so that brings into question, what is this moment? Because we've always centered, and even now continue to center, you know, blackness in protest. But if you look at the images that we're seeing alongside of black protest for humanity is a white civil war around what kind of society we're gonna be. They're happening simultaneously. And so, but we are so used to in, in the US to having this, this um, binary um, battle between white and black that we will impute blackness whether it's there or not. And so I remember even with the um, Charlottesville um, protest that happened, it was, if you saw those scenes, it was young white people fighting young white people. There is something that is happening 
that is challenging the society that we we know here in the US. And the question is like, how do we unpack that to see it? And the bigger piece, you know, in, in some ways this is, um, I go back to uh, Mbembe, you know, is this confrontation um, what we're seeing in real time as what he calls the becoming black of the world? You know, the idea that, that you know, the ways in which blackness has actually cre helped to, um, to push out this level of terror because this, this, this um, antagonism and the creation of this other, this despised other, this inhumane other has helped to create the, the systems that now are actually being pushed back on other folks. And so um, that is a question that we need to grapple with because then if we don't, the strategies that we develop might not actually get to the heart of what we might we might be um, having to deal with. And then, um, and what is fascinating is that even if we're seeing the becoming black of the world, there is something powerful about the centering of blackness as the clarion call for justice. The centering of blackness, the centering of black leadership. Um, the, I always say the, one of the most revolutionary things we can do in the world is to follow a black leader. And so the, the idea that, that blackness is the call to action now provides an opening for something um, that can be powerful enough, I think, to transform. And, um, and then finally, I'll say this because I haven't been tracking time and I don't want to be like a bad cold person. Um, the, the piece that Alessandra asked me to talk about too is the, the possibility of the celebration of joy um, and the role of spirituality or, or resilience in, in healing. And I come out of, of community organizing. And so my answer might be a little different than that of others because uh, I've, I'd never really thought of myself as, um, as an artist. And so I've always looked in deep admiration to people that create what I think is art, you know, music and sound and images that, um, that in movements are able to find beauty and, and how that beauty is, is, you know, just completely inculcated in the people themselves and become a propelling uh, factor for how, how they move forward. And I think that we continue to see that. Like we continue to see um, the voices that are, are, are actually propelling us into a future that we can't see and um, that are, that's opening up an imagination that if we didn't have it would, would make us nihilistic. You know, that is calling for a beauty beyond um for me that has my my faith has been that place because you know when you had ken sing earlier uh michael i think about the ways in which i as i said i come from guyana music and rhythm is in our our spirit is in our blood it is it is what we do in the darkest times i remember um, how we talk about the moaning of our grandmothers, the rhythm of moaning, and, you know, just the ways in which uh, it just calls us into something so different. And, you know, I say all of that because uh, movement has rhythm. You know, movement is, is the space where, for me, the joy and resilience of rhythm happens. There is, there is the, the, the marching forward and being able to be in a communal space, in a truly Ubuntu space where you know this is like, this is, you know, kind of a, a deeper sort of Fananian idea of all of a sudden, those that you had never even known before in that moment, in that space, 
becomes not just your family, but a family that because of relationship will, will is the, your pathway to, to live it, right? It's, it's, it's a deeper understanding of resilience where even in the midst of terror, you can see each other, you can feel each other, the pulse of your marching, the all night um, food and thinking and laughter, the ways in which whether you worship different gods or no gods at all, you're clasping hands and knowing that something else is gonna happen on the other side, that even though you may not see it will be more beautiful than what the thing that you have right now. Like all of this is happening. Um, and the, the other thing that I would say is that the beauty of self-determination cannot be underestimated. The idea that in this moment, I can be whatever I choose to be and that the world will just have to, have to um, embrace me. And then I have all of these people around me saying yes, and, and I'm going to fight for that too. There is something powerful about that. And, um, and then finally, what Du Bois always says, like the one great thing um, in this country is, is what Black people have been able to do out of the dung of the misery here. And, and I think that that continues to be true. And the one thing that I believe that this moment gives that is truly resilient is the ability to be filled with grace. It is the ability to love in spite of. It is the ability to, to live not just for yourself, but to live for the future of those around you and those yet to be born. That kind of grace that is, um, cannot be, um, it cannot be, you, we can't think of it as something that's thrown away because without that grace, not only will we see nihilism, but there would be a level of, of just pure terror that we would turn on each other. And so the idea that we don't become that which we are fighting is to me like the greatest, the greatest part of, of movement. And, and that to me is what will keep us resilient. So I hope I, I responded somewhat to your question, Michael, and I hope I didn't go over my 15 minutes. And you know what? And if you did, I would have not known because I was just so into listening to you um, and, 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 and as always knew that you would deliver in such a way that one would push this conversation in a certain kind of way. I, I'm so, so wonderfully happy that the order went you and then the great brilliant Latoya. Um, because you mentioned something. I met Latoya in Italy two years ago, um, again through Alessandra. But you mentioned something that I think that is so important in the way that you use sort of the language and the order of the language you use. You said Black women and Black men. Because oftentimes the way that we articulate state violence of a Black bodies has always been hege hegemonic around Black men bodies and invisibilize Black women, even in our freedom movement organizing, we have invisibilized Black women. So this notion of you and then um, Latoya going uh, back to back is important, but also, Charlene, because you mentioned art, and as Latoya is also an artist living the same thing, this, this, this sort of bicontinental relationship between a continent of Africa and a continent of Europe. I, I'm, I'm wondering for you, Latoya, this notion of mm. art. I, I always believe that art, particularly Black art, Black music, is both a political resistance, to Charlene's point, a theological critique around how you reimagine joy. I'm a Black gay man, and the, the, the notion of house music and its lyrics, think about James Baldwin's ethic of love, was always grounded in his ethic of love. Love is the message. Let's have a love break. So I wonder for you, for Latoya, what does it mean for you to be sort of bicontinental? How has art played an important role for you? And this thing around uh, oftentimes, again, as I said to Charlene, state violence, um, particularly in this moment, is not just over Black bodies in an American context, 
but really is what I call the catastrophe of the very first global sin, which is white male patriarchal uh, 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 and a sort of neoliberal project of global capitalism. So, Latoya. Yes, thank you so much for having me here. It's uh, an absolute honor. And I'm very happy to see you again, uh, Michael, Alessandra. Yes. Um, I'm very happy to also hear the issue of love. I will touch on that later. Um, I would say that um, for me, being here in Europe is my first real experience of what um, racism is, of this injustice of um, the system of white superiority is something which you have glimpses of when you are back home because even there it exists. Uh, and I really, found the core of it and the experience of it and to understand what this is here in Germany, here in Europe. Yes, and I realize also that this system of uh, white superiority, this cannot be what we look to when we're asking for change. Um, in the times of COVID, there is, of course, I think it brought a shift here in that some things were kind of put on a break. So there was a new change in that people felt what it's like to be oppressed. You know, what is it like to be stuck in the house and not have the option of, um, of um, privileges, of um, all these other distractions which are there. I think this situation is a kind of, was also a kind of incubator to see what it's like and to show the power of the state that can take away the privileges in a matter of weeks. So the state as it is has proven that um, it does not pursue a culture of love. It does not pursue a culture of healing. And this triggered by the, in plain view, broad daylight murder of our brother, George Floyd, I think has a very specific meaning. And I, for myself personally, it's again a meaning of um, spirituality has to be part of the struggle. It's also conveyed to me the meaning that, um, um, we can call it decolonization, or rather integration of our traditional knowledges has also to be part of the, has to be part of the solution. Otherwise, transformation that we seek is not possible. Um, these inhuman practices which are enshrined in the laws and in the administrative regulations, you know, why we see millions of people killed on the Mediterranean Sea, you know, where we see that the protections of our lives as minorities is constantly trampled on, you know, um, we, we, we need to return to, to other sources here. Yeah. And um, our, to our sisters and the brothers on the streets and the camps and the offices who constantly fear humiliation and discrimination, and abuse, we see that this system does not work for us and it will not help us achieve what we want. We ourselves, we don't have the choice as, uh, as black people. I think we are called, we are here for a reason and we have to take this in our hands. We have to take this in our hands, we who fight everyday racism. We have to say that we have the power from our ancestors and we have to continue this fight which has gone on for centuries of resistance. And um, exactly as um, Charlene said, we have tools which we do not use. I have learned that um, in, 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 in my traditional culture, there is art is not having the function of entertainment, but rather has a function of healing, of transformation. And I think when we can utilize 
on the powerful um, effects, powerful effects of change which art can bring, which song can bring, which dance can bring, um, then we are on another path um, and see that there is something that we can do. We have to continue to nourish, nourish these knowledges. Um, of course, the, 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 the aspects of how we take part, how we participate in this struggle um, has, of course, individual um, elements as well as um, collective elements. Today, I just wanted to, to come back to self. Because when we think of the states and we think of the institutions with all its crimes, one tends to feel powerless powerless as the state put so much energy into covering up the truth. We see how, how, how things are manipulated and controlled. And often as one starts, okay, I would like to make a change, where do I start? So I would say there I get really a lot of strength from my traditional spiritual religions from calling on the Orishas, um, which is a practice which one should do daily. Um, I must admit that it is not always easy to maintain the practice, but I do encourage that we have to find our practices and nourish them. We have to find a way and ask ourselves and also be, be, be investigators into who we really are as a people, who we really are. I feel whiteness has wandered, has journeyed so far away that we cannot wait for them. We as black people, we as indigenous people do have to, how do have this obligation, commitment and responsibility to see that we discover if we have not got it, who we really are. We have to make this internal dialogue and see what we have been told. Is it accurate? Is it the truth? Is it time to change, to change the stories which we have internalized? This is a very important question to ask and to see that we have this obligation to really do the, re to do the investigations into our own family history, into the history of our people, because it is time to really upgrade all these outdated messages that we constantly hear about who we are and what we are. So I give a small example, like here in Germany, there have been several cases of sisters and of brothers being uh, victims of racist killings. In the efforts to mobilize the community, there is so much resistance because the first thought is what did he do? What did she do? She must have done something wrong. So this is where really the first step, I would say as individual, as I'm talking today about the individual um, power, we can try to to, to mobilize within ourselves before mobilizing others outside is to really see that we take out the story, update the stories we ourselves carry in our heads. This is something very important. That we look in and say, deep within our bones, what is there? What is in our bones? What can we give to our communities, to our people? What can we give to the world? How are we showing up in the community? I think we as a people have to be involved. Every one of us has to be involved in community service. There's so much work to be done that uh, uh, community organizers are totally overwhelmed with the work. And I think as black people, we have to be all involved in community service. We all have a unique gift which the world needs, and we have to bring that out and offer it to our community. And look, what is the message that we carry to support the people? What message are there? What can we give? What is it we have to offer? 
Each one has a specific gift which he has to offer. How do we support ourselves? How do we allow others to support us? There again, we come to the, what I would say, the, the art form of vocalizing, of singing, of mourning together. It's all not, it's all a very important factor which we have to nourish in helping us support each other. These, these um, vicious attacks which we experience daily, and now with social media, we are flooded with these images. And a self-care, self collective self-care in traditional cultures are art. It's singing together. It's dancing together. The actions we can take that we can participate, participate together are very important in increasing the vibration of our people. And this is some of the things that we can do. Um, Coming back to love, loving ourselves, learning to love ourselves individually and collectively is I think also a very important aspect. So to, to short, to make it short, there was, uh, there is the Orisha here, yeah? Oshun, the bringer of love. <laughs> and um, there is a story that when Olodumare created the world, he sent out all the Orishas and they all went and most of them men. And they were, you know, very arrogant and um, saying, oh, what can Ocean do? She's not actually, why is she coming with us? She's not so important. And off they went and she waited back. After seven days, they came back and they said, wow, we went, but we, we did all we could, but nothing worked. The rivers are still dry. Uh, no plants are growing. It's very hard to live in this place where you sent us. And he thought, and he looked, Olodumare looked at all of them and said, hey, but where is Oshu? And they looked, they say, yeah, we don't know where she is. He called for Oshu and she came and she explained that she had been treated without any dignity. And due to that fact, she decided to withdraw. Olodumare spoke with the other Orishas and they begged Oshu for forgiveness and said they would never repeat the mistake. Oshu went down with them and things started to grow. The earth was filled with waters, the plants were blooming, children were born. And I think we have to constantly bring ocean back. We have to bring ocean back for she has wandered far. We have pushed her away. Yes. So I, so a couple of things that are coming to my spirit in this moment. Thank you, one, for bringing up Oshun, who particularly is in my space. There is a salsa, but it used to be a house singer called La India, mm. who plays a song called Love and Happiness. And it is a celebration of both Oshun and Yemeya. Mm. When I hear you speak, as well as Charlene, I'm also reminded this notion of the moan especially the moan of the black woman. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of a, a, a colleague of Charlene and mine, a, a professor of mine named Dr. Ebony Marshall Terman, who talks about this notion of womanist choreographic methodology, right? There was, there's a choreography in the moaning of a black people that can reimagine this notion of that you're talking about tools. Um, but I'm also thinking about, as we talk to Jauso from Brazil, right? As last year, we celebrated the 400th anniversary of the very first Africans being brought into bondage in Jamestown, Virginia. This year is the 400th anniversary of Plymouth Rock. So the marks in many ways, the continued disembarkment, embodiment of, 
of indigenous people. And as um, through great colleagues of mine and Dr. Mitty Fuller Love and Dr. Bob Fuller Love and Robert Simber through the New School did an initiative called 400 Years of Inequality and they used the tagline, stolen land, this <laughs> genocide of Native American or indigenous people with stolen hands. Mm. This, so there's this twin pandemic, if you will, that oftentimes, of course, because of, of uh, what I call the American Negro imperialism, who only American Negroes, we only believe that blackness exists through us first and foremost, we privilege that way, don't oftentimes engage in this, dial this, this, this transnational conversation with our brothers and sisters in Brazil, not rec recognizing and realizing that there are more people of African descent living in Brazil than in the US. So as we bring a Jauso from Brazil uh, in that way, but also for you, Jauso, this notion of education, or the way we've been miseducated around freedom and movement, how it's important in this moment to sort of rectify those sort of miseducational tools that were intentional in order to keep the status quo the status quo. Justin Jailson, I have características peculiares como brasileño. Primero, de que yo he nacido y crecido, creado en una favela, en una favela en Rio de Janeiro. Yo soy un favelado, con mucho orgullo. Soy también un hombre negro. Y esto no es sencillo, porque muchas personas como yo en Brasil no se reconocen negras y piensan como personas blancas. Entonces, ser negro y favelado en Brasil no es sencillo. Soy también un intelectual, un profesor de la universidad y muchas pocas personas negras y faveladas llegan a ese lugar en mi país. Y muchos que llegan no reconocen sus orígenes, tienen vergüenza de sus orígenes. Y es muy importante para nosotros jamás olvidarnos nuestras orígenes. Entonces, me, to me torné un cambiero intelectual, un profesor universitario, pero siempre siendo un activista. En toda mi vida, toda la vida, yo tengo luchado, luchado contra la perspectiva de violencia que caracteriza mi país. Mi país, embora nosotros, brasileños, eh, tengamos fama de cordiales, gentiles, nuestro país tiene básicamente una estructura muy violenta. Son tres instancias de la elección de Bolsonaro. No es, no es una casualidad. La elección, la elección de Bolsonaro expresa, expresa todo nuestro racismo histórico, todo nuestro chauvinismo y todo nuestro control de las riquezas del país en las manos de una minoría, minoría blanca, de hombres, ricos y heteronormativos. Esta es la estructura del poder en país, en Brasil, históricamente. Pero otro problema fundamental es que históricamente nuestra oposición a este grupos sociales dominantes, no es, no es diferente. Nosotros también tenemos una oposición blanca, de clase media o rica, heteronormativa, eh, que no se identifica históricamente con nuestras agendas. No hay una agenda que efectivamente contemple las necesidades de la población negra 
no campo de los partidos democráticos, históricamente. En campo de la sociedad civil, esto es una cuestión fundamental hoy y siempre en nuestro país. Históricamente, los partidos democráticos progresistas nunca llevaron en cuenta, cuenta, por ejemplo, el genocidio negro que ocurre en Brasil. En 20 años, un millón de personas fueron asesinadas. 75% eran negros. 75%. Hoy, en mi país, en mi ciudad, en Rio de Janeiro, la policía mata, en media, todos los días, cinco personas. De esas, 80% son negras. Mi, solamente en marzo, entre marzo y mayo, la policía de origen danero mató 65 personas. En plena pandemia, la policía siguió matando. ¿Y cómo, dónde la policía mata? En las favelas. Porque la policía y el Estado tienen una política genocida, cuyo pretexto, cuyo motivo aparente es la guerra a las drogas. En nombre de esto, que es si te ha cambiado en el principal tipo de crimen en nuestro mundo, la, la agenda racista fue naturalizada entre la población como un todo, tanto entre los blancos como entre los negros. Entonces, esos elementos que estructuran la desigualdad brasileña, el chauvinismo, el racismo institucional y el patrimonialismo necesitan ser colocados, ser puestos en cuestión por una nueva agenda. Entonces, nosotros no podemos solamente hablar sobre la resistencia. Claro que históricamente tenemos resistido. Claro que só estamos sobreviviendo por causa de nuestra capacidad de resistir. La, la capacidad de nuestros antepasados de resistir. Y ahora nosotros. Pero es muy poco hablar de resistencia. Porque cuando hablamos de resistencia, continuamos afirmando que los Estado, que los blancos, que los dominantes son los protagonistas. Y que nosotros somos meros coadjuvantes. Solamente coadjuvantes. Solamente figurantes. Solamente reativos. Que nosotros no criamos, no inventamos. Cuando dejamos de afirmar nuestra agenda, seguimos asumiendo lo que llamo, llamo de paradigma de la ausencia, de la carencia. Entonces, superar el paradigma de la carencia, de la precariedad, como el Estado y los blancos dominantes. Paradigma es una forma de olhar el mundo, de mirar el mundo. Es una visión del mundo. El Estado blanco construye este, esta visión del mundo y la afirma como si fuese, fuese universal. En esta visión del mundo, en este, parad en este paradigma, nosotros siempre negros, favelados, indígenas, somos ubicados en la posición de inferioridad. Y 
muchos de nosotros, de nosotros aceitan esto como natural. Los últimos años, el movimiento feminista y principalmente el movimiento feminista negro tiene fortalecido mucho en todo el mundo, me parece. Pues, seguramente en Brasil. Si es si es vuelto bien más fuerte, se ha vuelto más protagonista. Pero tenemos un problema, tendremos un problema que es nuestros jóvenes negros, hombres, siguen siendo invisibilizados y masacrados. Los únicos lugares de los jóvenes y hombres blancos en Brasil es en cárceles y en cementerios. No hay prácticamente la presencia de jóvenes negros en la escena política, en la sociedad civil, en la universidad. Están nos, nuestro, desafío, nuestro reto, por tanto, es seguir fortaleciendo el feminismo negro especialmente. Mas criar un movimiento que traiga otra vez para la cena política los jóvenes negros. Para eso, nosotros tendremos que entender las bases que sustentan, sostienen, que soportan, dan soporte al discurso de Estado racista blanco. Bolsonaro y Trump hicieron un, algo muy curioso, muy raro. Ellos tuvieron la, la capacidad de transferir para el mundo público, para la dimensión pública, a la cuestión de un sentimiento privado, primario, como el odio. Hoy en Brasil, el odio es un instrumento de acción política y de unidad de los racistas. Nosotros, entonces, necesitamos más y más traer para la dimensión pública nuestros buenos sentimientos. La base es la empatía. Y por extensión de la empatía, tendremos la amorosidad, la generosidad, la bondad, la capacidad de, de convivir, de la convivencia. Esto es la base fundamental de lo que llamo de paradigma de la potencia. La pandemia está revelando algo muy interesante, muy raro. La, la ciudad es siempre pensada a partir de tres elementos. La, el acceso a equipamientos urbanos, equipamientos urbanos, urbanos servicios urbanos, y dinero, renta, capital. Solo que la pandemia demuestra que hay otros elementos muy más valiosos para la vida. Y la convivencia, la sociabilidad son, son fundamentales. Y esto aquí en Brasil, como probablemente en todos los otros países occidentales, es muy más presente en las periferias, en las comunidades. El problema entonces de la, de la ciudad capitalista es la reducción del sujeto apenas solamente a la condición de consumidor. Nos, nuestra agenda negra 
e periférica e feminista. E no sujeito pleno, né, o cidadão, cidadão pleno, como principal ator para a construção de uma cidade humana, fraterna, democrática, humanizada. Então, se nossa renda política, e estou concluindo, finalmente, necessita ter esses três elementos fundamentais. A luta contra o chauvinismo, a luta contra o racismo estrutural e a luta contra o conceito de cidade centrada somente em o consumo de coisas e de las personas. Por esta concepción de ciudad y de sujeto racista y chauvinista, se considera natural que las personas necesarias y otras descartables, desechables. Entonces, algunas son necesarias y otras no son desechables, otras no son humanas. Por esto, pueden ser eliminadas podem ser exterminadas. Por isso, Bolsonaro e Trump querem o fim de isolamento social. Aislamento social. Querem o fim porque sabem muito bem que as vidas mais atingidas pela pandemia são as nossas mais afetadas, as vidas mais afetadas, as vidas das pessoas negras, latinas, indígenas. Por isso, lá, a pandemia expressa, como nunca, os dois projetos em disputa nesse momento histórico. Um projeto que valoriza o amor e a fraternidade. E aqueles que tinham ódio e na, nas hierarquias como princípios de Xangô. Eu sou filho de Xangô. Xangô é um orixá, incluso casado com o Xun. Xangô é o orixá da justiça. Tudo que nós precisamos esse ano é unir Xangô e Oxu, justiça e amor. E por isso devemos luchar e celebrar nossos mortos, nossas vidas, sempre. Graças. Thank you. This piece that he brought up about Bolsonaro not for isolation and against and this piece around not caring that black people get COVID. We call it the, the disposable bodies. I'm reminded of a couple of things to, to wrap this up. I'm reminded of a couple of things. One is that as we're in the COVID moment, that next year marks the 40th anniversary of GRID, gay-related immunodeficiency. So between these two pandemics, are we situated? And this notion of black bodies, um, I, I think about Ronald Reagan as he became president in 1980 and his neoliberal sort of regime as he moved away from what we call the Barry Goldwater ultra conservative project around less government and more of a neoliberal project connected to global capitalism. The pandemic of both uh, of HIV and AIDS and the false uh, uh, war on drugs and the epidemic of crack impacting black bodies. There's a, a, a black lesbian named Kathy Cohen out of uh, Chicago who wrote an emblematic text called The Boundaries of Blackness. And one of the things that she asserts that is Ronald Reagan, of course, was cutting social programs when at the time epidemics, both crack and HIV was impacting black communities that the black community made a political and an intentional decision to deal with crack. 
because the sort of political response and theological response was that if black gay men were getting AIDS, that we deserved it. It was God's way of getting rid of perversion from the earth. And so even to me in resisting discourses, there's hegemony. The boundaries of blackness means who is worthy to be saved. And so here we are some 40 years later. So this move away from conservative Republican sort of regime to Trumpism or fascism, or return back to fascism. And so COVID emerges, and for my community, an epidemic, a drug epidemic called crystal meth. Why do I bring this up? Because we're having this conversation around the political sort of resistance and radical love around in the diaspora of blackness, and that a critique has to also be made. That even in the space of Black Lives Matters, Black gay men lives have not mattered most because when we talk about HIV and AIDS, Black gay men have the highest HIV uh, AIDS prevalence and incidence rate in the world and there's no outcry. When we talk about Black Lives Matters, a critique has to be made because Black trans women continue to be beat and brutalized and murdered in a way and there's no critique that, has, that was made and one has to be made whose lives matter most in this space called Black Lives Matters. And so we have to have this very intentional conversation, though it's hard and it's difficult and it's uncomfortable and we have to wrestle with it, but it's in wrestling with it that we can reimagine a new space as Latoya talked about a utility of our tools. And so I, I bring this up because one of the challenges to talk about Black trans women being brutalized and murdered for Black people across the globe is that we then had to reconcile that the, the, that the same men, of course, not necessarily the specific same men, but the same men who are being brutalized by state violence through police brutality are the same men who are killing Black trans women. I'm going to say that again. So we have to wrestle with this discomfort that the same men who are being beat, brutalized and beat through black through police brutality are the same men in our own community murdering and dismembering black trans women. A critique has to be made. Last thing I mentioned is I have to I'm reminded as, as Latoya talked about and Charlene talked about sort of the moans of black women and this notion of the body notion of particularly the black woman's body. So I'm reminded of a, of a trans woman who's an icon in the house ball community, Leomi Maldonado, who we call the Wonder Woman, who's used her body, Vogue in many ways as a protest. I remember years ago when my colleague Robert Simbert um, interviewed Leomi for the Arbor Santana or history, Barbara or history project. And Leomi said to be black and Latina and trans being born and reared in a Bronx is to be angry all the time. I vogue to save my life. I put that in conversation with James Baldwin, who once said to be black and relatively race conscious is to be angry all the time. I write to save my life. I, I, am, a mem I am a believer that this moment is what we call a Kairos moment, a Kairos moment of reckoning. That the European father tells us, I think, therefore I am. She goes on to say, but the black woman, the artist in all of us says, I feel, therefore I can be free. This is that moment I think for us. So I end with a small video. Alexander knows I love playing videos. Charlene knows I love playing videos of an of a intersection of I'm a Janet Jackson fanatic, for folks who know him, but such a Janet Jackson fanatic, but she did a song called Can't Be Stopped. But think about again, this piece around what Latoya and Charlene said, but also this piece of what Daoun says about black feminists and abolitionists, um, it's always been in that space. She does a song called Can't Be Stopped. So whoever created the video coupled it with an actor named Jesse Williams. And Jesse Williams, gave a speech at the NAACP Image Awards and when he won Best Actor. It's such a speech of critique. And it's a wonderful, I think, coming together of this moment. And so I'll ask Paige to play that and we'll then open it up for conversation. And beautiful thing about the, the video, that the lyrics of the song are placed or embedded in the video. 
thank you all the speakers and Michael and everyone for being here. So I, I heard from uh, Jalison this idea that we need to make our own agenda, like stop dreaming our liberation, looking to what the oppressor is doing and start dreaming more from the space of, of the land that is touching our feet and the people around us, no? And, um, and I want to link that with what Charlene Sinclair said at the beginning of that uh, the grace of this fight right now is to not become what we're fighting you know, so I feel this time and, and the particular moment of the struggle in the United States give some update for the other marginalized resistance movements around the world to, to see what's happening in, in the metropoly in, in the U.S. Because uh, so my, I'm curious how much in relation like the local the grassroots movements in the based in the united states and in europe around identities and and resistant and rebuilding a new world or new worlds uh, is is known in those movements how in relation and dialogue you are with other resistance movements like the zapatistas the kurdish movement uh, other movements in Africa around uh, uh, ways of liberation from patriarchy or indigenous movements around the world? I think, I don't think we're in enough conversations with movements around the world. I think that there are a lot of young people now that are in the movement for Black Lives and there's the Black Lives Movement, there's um, Black Youth Project, and there's um, uh, movement for Black Lives, and they get conflated a lot. And uh, so they're actually um, variants of the same movement. And in addition to that, you have um, grassroots organizing that is been, that comes out of a, um, a history of uh, structural change movement building. And so then you have the folks that come out of civil rights movements. And and as Michael said, that comes out of um, the movement for um, the, you know, the whole public health movement around stopping the, the growth and proliferation of um, HIV, AIDS, et cetera. So what I believe is that there is just not enough conversation between movements, even though many of the young people from the movement for Black Lives have now begun to start engaging internationally with um, with uh, young people that are part of the Palestinian movement, um, some young people that are in South Africa and um, in primarily in in London, I believe, not not as much so in other European countries. And um, from what I can gather, there have been folks that are a part of the traditional organizing movement that has connected deeply with. Um, with people in Brazil, but not around the, um, the issue of blackness and the issue of race. Many of them have connected around the landless movements and the, the um, political education training that has come out of that. So we're in an interesting time where there is a deep need for people to be connected internationally and, um, and to look at the material reality of race within the capitalist project. And so many of the folks that are doing this work in the US that have a left perspective come out of traditional sort of Marxist racist constructed, they tend to be, you know, overwhelmingly um, white. And, um, and not only do they come out of this place of, of race being constructed, so they don't engage the questions around race and the various um, mechanisms of disciplining and controlling and exterminating on the basis of, of race. And so, so that's one of the pieces. The other thing that many of them don't do, and I had the, uh, the ability to go down to Brazil back in September and recognize that the other piece that they don't do is to understand the import of ideological factors and the role 
of, of um, religion as an ideological frame that creates the fertility, the ground fertility to be able to do this kind of, um, this to, to move this level of violence. And so I do think that there is a, a need for a deeper cross, you know, more international engagement around these, um, these movements, particularly with young people um, who in the US tend to be very ahistorical. So uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, to thank for putting together this, this panel and the speakers. Um, my question is um, around exhaustion and hope. And, you know, Latoya, I was really, I, I was really, this is my first time meeting and it was great to hear um, a lot of the stuff, that, especially that piece around the spirituality piece. But I think what is coming up for me during this, this conversation is I'm exhausted. And I think just for the first couple of months when I saw that brother in Georgia who got shot, um, I was realizing that I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, I was numbing myself. Um, because I still, I didn't want to go back where, where, when I, I didn't want to go back to that place where I, I felt where, when um, Eric Garner um, got murdered on my TV screen, right? And um, so for folks who are like, who are black, who are doing this work, um, but then to hear that we had to do more work, um, I'm exhausted. And then there's a part around hope that it seems like it's hard to, to maintain hope. So I'd love to hear um, from any of the folks around, you know, uh, yeah, any thoughts on that part? Just a couple of things. I think I, I, I'll just speak for me. Um, there's a blessing in some ways, and I don't want to call the next thing a curse, but I oftentimes talk about what it meant. I always theologize the coming from my mother's womb. Um, that there's something about that black woman that just something me, the epistemology of something that continues for, for me, that, that, that's created a space for me to continue to always hope, right? I, I think about going to union and some of the, a lot of the language around the economy of hope. Um, was always, we were always in this dialogue around that, particularly when we're looking at liberation, some of that conversation was how can we ever get tired when folks are being murdered in the street? And we are privileged being in this one space, but being tired and exhausting is real. It's real. And not taking care of oneself does nothing for the movement. In fact, self-sacrificing is the antithesis of freedom. It's part of the, my critique of the crucifixion narrative of Jesus Christ versus the social justice historical narrative of Jesus. So th that's number one, but also think about what Charlene brings the voice up a lot. I think about what the voice said about hope, a hope that is unhopeful, right? That is hopeless, not unhopeful. So there's something in this, this space that that we had to be absolutely real about. And when you're tired and you're exhausted, you have to give your space, have to give yourself space enough to be real around those things. Um, because again, we do nothing, there's no service, a self-sacrifice and so much so that you're no good to not only yourself, but to the movement, if you, if you, if you will. But also we're sending the wrong message out to folks. It's absolutely the wrong message. And oftentimes women are the bearers of sort of the burdens of this notion of always, always push. Let me back into that. One of my favorite movies is The Color Purple. And the, the Oprah's character, uh, Sophia goes to Whoopi Goldberg's character, Miss Healy, and she, she says, you told Harper, which was her husband, to beat me. At the end of that, Miss Healy says, this life be over soon. Heaven lasts always. This notion that your eschatological reward is in the, that is the move, that's a virtue. You have to sacrifice yourself because that is the virtue of the, of, the, of the work that we have to do. And I'm just, I have grown tired of that. If I'm, if I'm tired of something, it's tired of that bullshit. Me and Charlie talk about this a lot. I'm tired of believing in that bullshit. It does me no good. In fact, last thing I'll say about that, my mother passed away in 2007. And I remember two years ago, um, oh, the 10 year anniversary of her passing, I heard her 
and that voice of her speak to me and say, I had to let her go. Not let her go, not the memory, but to unlearn. Joseph talked about unlearning, unlearning this notion that I've seen her do over and see black women do over and over and over again. Give of yourself, give of yourself, give of yourself, sacrifice yourself, even at the detriment to your own soul. É, sobre o que mais me agrada em eventos como este é justamente sua capacidade de alimentar nossa esperança. Eu tenho 60 anos. Já estou jubilado na universidade e estou desde meus 13 anos, 13 anos em la atividade social. E sigo com o mesmo entusiasmo. Porque há uma juventude de que eu he trabalhado muitos anos que muito me alimenta. E eu estou seguro que também eu as alimento. Então, se manter a esperança só é possível, só é possível se trabalharmos com a perspectiva de que a, a coisa mais bella que nós outros das periferias construímos é a capacidade de conviver com os outros, de ser, sermos solidários, de sermos fraternos, de nos educarmos, nos educarmos juntos. Todo o sentido desse grupo que está cá é que é um grupo especialmente de educadores e educadoras. São pessoas que dedicam suas vidas a la construir as pessoas melhores, o um mundo melhor. Porque nós outros queremos, acima de tudo, nós outros queremos nos tornarmos melhor. É por isso que essa é a minha visão. Nós queremos, eu sou com três netos, eu tenho três netos, e eu preciso me tornar melhor para eles. Então, se lá a esperança não tem que ser simplesmente de cambiar o mundo, mas sim de permanentemente nos cambiar nos tornarmos seres humanos melhores. Por isso, Lúcio, não lute para os outros. Eu luto por mim. Eu luto para salvar a minha humanidade. E esta rede solidária muito me alimenta nisso. No Instituto que é criado, o Instituto Maria e João Aleixo, é uma celebração de duas pessoas que dedicaram sua vida a nós outros. Duas pessoas iletradas que levaram seis, cinco filhas e um filho à la universidade. E todos e todas comprometidos com a sociedade melhor. Então, nosso trabalho é como trabalhar numa perspectiva internacional esta dimensão da potência das pessoas, especialmente as negras e as periféricas. Nós outros tendemos que superar o nosso maior problema, que é a autoestima muito baixa. Desde que nascemos, as pessoas dominantes, o Estado, disse que nossa cor negra é um estigma. Nossa local de vivência, de vivienda, é um estigma. Nosso color negro, nossa favela, nossa a formação de nossos padres, que são trabalhadores manuales, por estudarmos na escola pública, em Brasil, é muito, muito estigmatizada. E por nossa origem migrante. Então, se é o desafio fundamental, é o reto fundamental, é afirmarmos nossa, nossa potência. Que nós outros sabemos viver dimensões complexas da vida e que temos muito a contribuir na construção da cidade. Por isso, o sentido da Universidade Internacional das Periférias, que é o programa do Instituto Maria Juan Aleixo, é trabalhar esta potência, difundir esta potência. Então, se pode nos conhecer melhor em nossos sites, 
do nosso sítio. E te, temos muita esperança de que poderemos seguir juntos construindo este mundo que de reza, mas especialmente mais importante é construir um novo mundo. É. Cada um de nós outros nos alimentarmos de esperança, de alegria, de possibilidade de construir esta cidade que tanto acreditamos. Eu sei que eu tenho que falar agora, mas eu estou muito feliz de ter participado com vocês. Eu estou muito emocionado de fazer parte desta rede, desta rede de pessoas tão humanas, solidárias e generosas e contem comigo sempre para manter essa esperança e essa solidariedade viva. Muitas graças. Ok, so talking about um, self care, um, I would like to mention like um, that we live in a toxic society, and colonization does not only take place outside of ourselves, it also takes place in ourselves. And um, talking about that, we look what exactly are the factors, you know, for colonization perpetuation in ourselves. And I would say one is if we get disconnected from the spirit, from our source, if we are not connected with our body, if we deny um, emotions or feelings which are negative, and for I would say if we distort the story, that is we wander away from what the truth and the reality is. In the last, uh, I would say in the past one year, I can say for myself that in our movement, there are certain truths that we have to recognize. One for me is that realizing that the movement, um, sometimes the community to which we attach ourselves is not necessarily a safe space. So often we like to, we have, we're together and we're fighting um, against uh, all these injustices, but in our organizations, in our movements, we have to accept this truth that it is not a safe space but rather a brave space. So we think it is necessary to align ourselves with, uh, with people whom we trust. And um, this is part of the self nurturing that we do not have to always um, get on with everybody. And we do not give ourselves over to those who um, are not having our best interest on the, in their heart. Um, in this, in this uh, movement, aligning with the spirit, accepting the negative emotions of emotions which we have learned to judge as negative. Um, my brother spoke just now of feeling exhausted. And often we feel exhausted and we say, we do not allow this feeling of exhaustion. And I think it is necessary to even embrace this feeling of exhaustion because in this feeling of exhaustion is our chance to recuperate. And with all the toxic um, images, the toxic experiences, it is okay to feel exhausted sometimes. And if we have, um, if we do our work, our daily practice of building really a small community that nurtures us, to build a small community of solidarity with which we can rely, then it's okay to feel exhausted. And know that the work goes on even without us. And to know there are others who have opened their arms for us to fall on. What I focus on is uh, to take from Michael Audre Lorde's A Litany um, for Survival. And I say that because uh, there was a, an amazing woman that does work out of Mexico and her name is just, um, I'm blanking on her name. But one of the things she asks is what is a good life? 
And I think that that is important because our tendency is to embrace a permanent life as opposed to a good life. Our commitment around our ability to live forever mm -hmm. as opposed to living a quality and good life can actually put us in tension with what it means to, um, to do self-care, to live well, to think of you know, the work that you've done as work well done. And I say Audre Lorde's Litany for Survival because we, have the, we run the risk of constantly being so much embattled that when goodness shows up, we can't even recognize it. Like we cannot even recognize how to see grace and goodness and possibility because we are, our battle stance is constant. Mm -hmm. And so uh, being able to, to really, you know, think about a good life Mm -hmm. And so I focus on um, a good life and not a permanent life. And, and what, as Sister, the, Sister Latoya just said, to know that this work continues. I am not a messianic person. You mm -hmm. know, we, we are beautiful beings, all of us. And, you know, it, and not any soul, one of us, will actually bring this new world into reality. It is all of us and the generations that will come after us. Mm -hmm. And um, I leave you with the story of a friend of mine, Adrian Hood, whose son, this June was the fourth anniversary of her son being killed by the police. She's in Ohio. And I, she touched me deeply because one of the, the murders that touched me was of Tamir Rice, the 12 year old who would have been 18 on Friday. And um, so the, what Adrian and I talked about, she had talked about, you know, just some days thinking that she will not be a grandparent from her son. And so we had to focus on, look at the seeds that your son has sown into the world because we are in such motion around this level of police brutality, he lives on. Mm -hmm. And so while I do agree with Michael about not um, valorizing the, you know, the whole crucifixion on the cross. Mm -hmm. What I do believe is that any given moment mm -hmm. can give us the opportunity for um, planting and growing seeds with, with, that will bear fruit that we may never see, but we have to believe that it will bear fruit mm -hmm. and, um, and that we can have a good life even in the midst of this kind of um, despair and violence. Because if we don't believe that, we can't dream into a possible and we can't dream into a hope. And so, um, so I, I would leave with that. Mm -hmm. Well, I just wanna offer up my gratitude for you three speakers and um, particularly because um, we're a mostly non-Black audience. I just really respect the time that you've given for this conversation. And I'm, I'm also kind of building off of Brandon's question of exhaustion. And I've been thinking about pedagogy this whole conversation and how the field of teaching and learning in cross-cultural relationships is such a field of trauma right now, um, particularly um, hearing that from the Black people in my life of being exhausted around um, expected to be teaching right now for people who are who have the privilege to just now be um, horrified at what has been happening. And, you know, on top of that, like, um, either sort of like fighting for, for, for intellectually for like basic human value, the basic like Black Lives Matter or like the liberal gaslighting or, um, you know, the ways that more or less, you know, non-Black people who are learning this stuff always are off the backs of, of, of Black people and Black femmes and Black women and Black trans people. And, and then on top of that, often so, like so often marketing it and like putting it on their resume as a badge as like people who are DEI experts. It just feels like such a field of trauma, like this, like learning, this teaching and this learning and it's connected to exhaustion and um, I've been sitting to try to clarify my question, but I think that's just more the context of like, do you all, are you all grounded in any vision for what learning together 
looks like, or is this a moment where we like caucus and, <laughs> um, you know, wait, wait until there's a little bit thing, something more that settles or, um, yeah, what, what, or if you have any teachers who have any wisdom around that, I'd love to just hear any thoughts. What, what I would say is that I come out of, um, again, you get, people want to give me multiple labels, you know, scholar, activist, whatever, and I choose organizer deliberately because it is a space of mutual learning. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a space where um, the knowledge that is gained from, uh, you know, the uh, living through oppression and violence is, what is uh, Foucault, uh, Foucault called subjugated knowledge, but all of our experiences provide knowledge. And it is a space for allowing the knowledge of our experience, the what we feel, what we've endured, what we what we fought against, and how we find joy. How are we resilient? All of the work that Michael is doing around Freedom School is is that is understanding. There's a huge reservoir of knowledge that is created, and it's the real question is what are the spaces that enable that generative um, possibility based on the various reservoirs of knowledge that we all bring. This is a beautiful pedagogical space because it's bringing people from all over. And so, you know, Kate, I deeply, deeply appreciate what you've said because in my work life, I am so tired of dealing with liberal white people, like literally <laughs> that all, like, you know, sister, I wanna be here for you and help you, help me understand, like I'm tired. But in these kinds of spaces where people are bringing their best thinking, their best heart, they, they are committed to struggle together, these are generative spaces. These are not exhausting spaces. And so I think that there needs to be more of this that happens. And there is no, there, when we think about movements, there has not been successful movements that have not seen as a part of the movement that kind of generative analysis, that generative, you know, strategic inquiry that lends itself to practice that allows for reflection and reorienting, et cetera. We don't have enough of those spaces. And what I would wish is that there would be more movement people that had the beauty of the thinking that so many folks in this space have, have dedicated their lives to and I you know I know many many of you are traversing both of those realities but there are a lot of movement people that I I am engaged with that don't have this and and I, I really wish there would be more of these kinds of spaces for us to literally think together part of the exhaustion is you're thinking and doing and you feel like like everyone's life hinges on you getting that thing right you know, and where is the time to just step back mm -hmm. and think with people? And, mm -hmm. you know, so that, that's what I would offer. I, you know, I'm blessed to have met Alessandra. I'm also have blessed, blessed to have met Charlene. I have been so blessed to have had the universe bring particular people in my space. And in fact, for me, the universe and my own spirit is the same. So I call them into my space, knowing that learning and teaching is simultaneous. So when I say that, the other thing I'm blessed around is being part of the house ball ballroom community that in many ways emerges, not, on, not only out of crisis, but uses performativity, both as a politics and a theology. So why is that important? Because as we organize, as Charlene talked about, and one gets tired to, in organizing, then we can go to a ball and enjoy each other and create spaces of joy and, 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 and praise um, and our ability to deal with these, these sort of oppressive structures that I think that the Baldwin community has been so placed in, neatly in. So that's three. And the other thing I would say is that, um, Kate, your, your, your framing of 
what you said was so on point. I remember when I first went to Union Theological Seminary and I said, had a, a professor who's a great colleague of Charlene's named Dr. Sam Cruz, and we were talking about white supremacy. And I said that as a black man, it is not my job to teach white people about white supremacy. That's doubly oppressive, right? And so the way that you framed that was so important because oftentimes we are put in that position to be able to have to do that when your, your wonderful notion that then white folk have the privilege of sitting back and say, I'm horrified, I had no idea. And the saying I had no idea was the work for them. Why well, did the work? I had no idea. I placed my, my, I placed my displeasure on Facebook, Black Lives Matters, you know, and so it can, but these kinds of spaces that has been curated through Alessandra, the Musa Geddes Foundation have really created and more, and more spaces of this sort of not only international dialogue, but one that, as Charlene talked about, one that is extremely generative. Last thing I'll say about that, my colleague Robert Simber was on the, the, the call with us. And Robert Simber is a member of Ultra Red. And uh, we have colleagues in Glasgow, Scotland called Arica. And Arica is a sound collective um, who was the first non-US uh, uh, artist to get commissioned to do the Whitney Biennial. And so in 2012, they hired Ultra Red to organize their week full of events and they were called, they were called the Sounds of Freedom. And so I did one on the House Ball Ballroom community. And I, one of the things I said was that what I will not do is have ballroom community perform in a space called the Whitney when their bodies are usually not welcome and they were going to be performing for the white gaze. But what I did say is that ballroom has something to say, let me go further, that ballroom has something to teach the world over about what it means to be human. The struggle for freedom in the face of real catastrophe, because this community are on intimate terms every day with death, but somehow, somehow, create spaces that are generative around the desires of joy and all these other things. But that's not indicative of us being ballroom. I often say that, that is the ontology of blackness. That is because ballroom comes out of the black experience and the black struggle for freedom. So. It's been such a rich, rich conversation. I really want to thank you all for, for bringing your wisdom, for being with us today, for giving <clears throat> us your experience, your perspectives on these things. It really helps us think and feel and understand and hopefully act and take care of ourselves and each other better. I just want to say, I'm just, it's giving me life this morning, <laughs> seeing all the eco people. Yeah! <laughs> it's giving me so much fun. <laughs>